Clerk will open the court. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas and this Honorable Court. Good morning. We have three cases set for argument uh, this morning. The first is 18-1181, Emerson Electric versus Johnson. Uh, let me see from Tarrant County and the second Court of Appeals District. May it please the court. Mr. Gunn will present argument for petitioners. Petitioners have reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Good morning, and may it please the court. Beware of dog, don't slip, mind the gap. These two and three word warnings from the English speaking world are common in our daily life as ways of protecting members of the general public. Today's case before you is about something more specialized, a licensed specialist who has obtained a product's verdict on warnings theories and on design theories. I would like to hit on three topics today, warnings, gatekeeping, and the jury charge. And on the warnings piece, I'd like to start where the parties agree. In a case with so much disagreement, let's start with the common ground the parties agree that the plaintiff knew about the dangers of terminal venting, and his JNOV response says he knew about them, and he told his nephew Antonio of the dangers of terminal venting, took them seriously. I won't go through the various slides that I've given you, uh, the tabs one through five of our oral argument handouts, to document the evidence on this point. Question is, given this factual starting point, what are the legal consequences? And we say the plaintiff's awareness of those dangers, which he took seriously, should kill the warnings claim on causation and duty grounds. And causation, I think, is a pretty clear argument. If he warned Antonio how to avoid the danger, he himself didn't need extra warnings. He already knew. Mr. Gunn, what do our cases tell us about how specific the knowledge has to be? Does it have to be that he knew what the what the um, the signs of venting would be in this particular compressor, or can it be more general than that? I think it. The cases don't give us a perfect algebraic equation, Your Honor, for solving that problem, but they they do say it has to be a fair indication. I think fair notice is what we're looking for. And as a policy matter, that you've put your finger on an important policy point, real estate, the space available for warnings is limited, not just the physical space on products, but the space in our heads. And you don't want a world of pharmaceutical bag stuffers where every product has so many warnings that the user just tunes out. The, the Court of Appeals did, did try to- Did your competitors find space for the warning uh, that the plaintiff says should have been given in this case in their materials? One competitor, Your Honor, found space for one warning about their compressor. We make larger compressors with louder equipment. It's not clear that noises have anything, have any link to venting in our equipment. A refrigeration system of just a few horsepower is gonna be very quiet. So one competitor warned about one noise, but, if we had given that warning, and this is the mischief that I'm talking about that attends uh, this, this gambit that the plaintiff persuaded the Court of Appeals to go down. The, if we gave the Tecumseh warning, for example, about electrical arcing noises, the, what I'll call snap, crackle, and pop, Mr. Johnson would have said, well, I didn't hear sputtering, sizzling, and popping. I heard, quote, rumbling. I noticed, I guess, a rumbling a faint rumbling sound. Mr. Morris called it a thud. And so the more we go down into the details, the more mischief the plaintiff can, can make by just gerrymandering the claim. Mr. And, yes, Your Honor. Gunn, does the, um, the need for warning, the duty to warn, is that in any way um, dependent on the training or experience of your ultimate consumer? In other words, what type of individual um, Yes. Might fall victim to failure to warn. That's absolutely right, Justice Guzman. The, 
It, it absolutely depends on the context of the training of, of the attended audience. Here we have someone with the highest licenses known in law with years of specialized training. And you see it play out in his relationship with his young helper. He warns Antonio, this is a danger. These pins can come shooting out like bullets because Antonio didn't know. Whereas the more experienced Mr. Johnson, the licensed specialist, he did know. He had the warnings he needed, our hundred words with the four pictorials, and that's just in English, not counting the French and Spanish. Our hundred words warned plenty, but he didn't need it. He knew enough to tell his assistant. And you see that also on the morning, that hot August morning in Fort Worth, when the phone call comes and Antonio Morris has gone to the Miller Food Mart to check out what's happening. And he, said, he calls back and tells Mr. Johnson, there's a blown fuse. And Mr. Johnson says immediately, stop in your tracks. Don't touch anything. I'm coming out. And we go down from there. He knew there were dangers. So why, Mr. Gunn, why isn't that, why doesn't that go to the plaintiff's uh, contributory negligence that the jury was asked about? In other words, the ob obviousness of the risk uh, to the manufacturer versus uh, the, the user of the product, why wouldn't, why does that conclusively establish no duty to warn? I, I think, I think I envision it, especially as a causation point, Your Honor, and I think it could be relevant. Uh, Justice Bland, to the issue of contributory negligence. Uh, but here, our point is, we warned him at length. He transgressed the warnings we did give. Wear protective goggles. He didn't. Do not use torch. He did. There's a dispute about whether he powered up the unit, but he didn't replace the terminal cover when applying power. So he violated his warnings, and we asked, we asked him why. He said, he had a history at this location. There had been blown fuses. This was, what, the fifth replacement compressor in six years. Something was amiss at that venue, and he understood it. And so he said, because of that history, I approached things differently at the Miller Food Mart that day. That's fine. He, he made his own judgment as a sophisticated licensed specialist, but there was no causal connection to what we did or didn't say. He knew what he was doing, and he did it his way. If I might shift to the gatekeeping point in the interest of time, this goes to the design point. The warnings we've just covered, the, the main warning, which was reached below, uh, the Court of Appeals didn't get to electrical checks, but the arguments I just gave you, I would ask you to reach electrical checks and it would dispose of that. Design is a very different beast. And this should have been just a design trial. The warnings claims never should have been in it. The two sides you can see from the briefing are living in different legal universes when it comes to what is design defect. We say you don't have a guarantee of a risk-free product. Products can be dangerous, just not unreasonably dangerous. Otherwise, we won't have automobiles, pharmaceuticals, knives, and so on. The plaintiff says a hazard-containing product is defective and unreasonably dangerous when safer alternatives exist. We don't agree, but the plaintiff's expert had a very similar view we gave in, you, in tab seven, we gave you his view, and he explained how he teaches his engineering students. We think Mr. that- Gunn, is, Yes, Your Honor. Did a safer design alternative exist, and did you challenge We challenged that uh, in the court below, Your Honor, but because of space limitations in this court, we have not brought that forward. We, we are here on the gatekeeping point, which is, this expert should not have taken the stand. And in a moment, I'll say, when he did take the stand, he didn't even get there. But I'll start at the threshold because we filed a 29-page motion to exclude. And we said, quote, all of his opinions are irrelevant and unreliable on page 242 of the record. We renewed it during the trial. The trial court said, let me review the matter for a moment, overruled. We objected again. <laughs> This witness did not use the proper yardstick. His yardstick was, if there's a safer design, use it. And that's fine engineering. It is not tort law. He never understood risk utility balancing. And I would ask the other side when they argue, point to where he said in his affidavit at the gatekeeping stage, anything about unreasonably dangerous, anything about risk, anything about the likelihood of injury. It is but not Mr. There. Gunn, does he have to testify on the ultimate issue or can he give the jury information with which it 
it can weigh the that information in light of the jury charge? Your Honor, he in a in a case involving sophisticated machinery, I think he does have to testify. There has to be an expert. But remember, even if he didn't, the reality is he did. Even if he didn't have to, he gave the testimony and it's at least reversible error to let him testify. I don't think a jury should be judging design defect of sophisticated industrial equipment without an expert. They could probably do it for a ladder. They could probably do it for a knife. I don't think they should be doing it for a compressor. But as I say, even if it wasn't necessary, the reality is he was a dominant witness in the trial, testified over two volumes of the record. And, you know, he was it, especially after the fire expert got dropped. He was the star of their show. And he had no basis for opining on design defect as understood in law. Now, I've also argued that if you set aside gatekeeping, what he said was conclusory, because at the end of his direct, when the plaintiff knew we were going to press on, we want the five factors discussed, they, were, they finally asked him, perhaps a bit grudgingly, oh, by the way, about these five factors, here, I'm going to read them. Do you still think the, uh, the product is defectively designed using that test? Oh, yes, it is. So he said it, the words are on the page, but he never understood it. He had no basis for saying it. That is a classic example of conclusory testimony. I'm going to skip in the interest of time to the final point and talk about the jury charge because we all have an opportunity to make a contribution, not just to justice in this case, but to improve the way product cases are tried going forward in future years. And we are here asking you to overrule the decisions in Turner and Acord. Those decisions were creatures of their time. Perhaps they were defensively decided at the time. Turner is certainly easy to defend because in the 1970s, we did not know yet how the law would come down on the precise meaning of design defect. And if you read the literature, the scholars throughout the 60s and 70s were working very hard Academy and the courts work. Mr. Gunn. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, so why is uh, hasn't the effect of Turner and Acord been limited uh, by the modern charge, which includes uh, safer alternative design? Uh, and and the jury in this case was given that charge. So why hasn't any uh, issue with, with Turner been abrogated by the Civil Practice and Remedies Code that specifically addresses uh, products liability cases. You're correct, Your Honor. The, the statute post-Turner and ACOR did require that one of the factors, the safer alternative design, that has now been elevated to an element, so it has to go in the charge. But look what was left behind. The likelihood of injury, the risk uh, of uh, risk versus utility, that really needs to be in the charge. It will incentivize lawyers to develop the record. You'll have better records. Juries will have better records. If, if the PJC had said, give the five factors, we'd never had Turner and Acord. Both sides would have known, this is where we're gonna end up. And so I'm gonna school my witnesses. I'm gonna get this testimony out. And the other side, sure, they probably would have said, Dr. Russell, let's talk about the gravity of the injury. You know, how serious could it be? And we would have said, let's talk about the likelihood. The, the record shows we've sold, what, tens of millions of these products. And this was our first report of an injury. Mr. Gunn, you can still do that even without the language in the charge. Turner talks about it, these factors being factors on which evidence is admissible. Isn't yes. that a different question from what it, it, evidence admissibility from what the jury should be instructed on? It, it is It is different. I'm just saying as a policy matter, it will incentivize lawyers to make a better record and they'll be more deliberate. We do it with the punitive damage factors, with the so-called Krauss factors, the five. We do it all the time. And we don't have to. The sky wouldn't fall if we took those out. But I think you get better records and, and we get more accurate fact findings by juries and it incentivizes the lawyers to make a better record. D Dr. Russell never addressed likelihood, which to me is essential in a design defect case. It's all about uh, what's the likelihood and what's the gravity of the injury. And it was just one hand clapping with him. He didn't know. He never talked about it. And it never occurred to him that it mattered. So I think the records will be better. If, and let me just hypothesize this. 
If Turner and Acord had never been decided, and we were considering this in the first instance, I don't think anybody would seriously argue it's a bad idea to give the factors. Nobody would say that. I think we've learned from history, we can get better records, and we see it with the punitive damages that the amicus brief from NAM lists a, a bunch of jury questions where factors are given. That's but to a reverse in this line. case, Mr. Gunn, wouldn't we have to say that the failure to give that instruction was harmful? Oh, I, th I think that is correct. And, and I'm, it depends what you do with gatekeeping. I think we have so much error on gatekeeping. It's not even clear to me you should reach the jury charge issue. Uh, but the gatekeeping error with Dr. Russell, I think, is, is harmful. Here, we're asking you, if it goes back on design, we have to retry this, give guidance, give instructions. That, that's, that's what we want. And that will be for the benefit of both sides. It's the kind of balanced instruction that Paige Keaton talked about in his article, said we can do this. It's not a plaintiff defendant thing. It's for the good of the system. If there are no further questions, I'm gonna conclude the argument here, Your Honor. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Gunn. We're ready to hear argument from the respondent. May it please the court, Mr. Levenger will present argument for respondent. Yes, uh, the defendant's argument about obviousness and knowledge is what I want to talk about first. Levenger, before you go on too much further, we can't see you yet. I don't know if you can turn on your camera. Okay. There we go. There. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to talk about their obviousness and knowledge argument. It has three major problems. First of all, they misstate what the relevant risk actually is. They're asking the wrong question and they're getting the wrong answer. Second, they mischaracterized what Mr. Johnson knew or more accurately did not know about the relevant risk. And third, they're ignoring what I would call four smoking gun documents about why the warnings and the product design here were defective. Now, in terms of the relevant risk, I think the governing case here is American Tobacco versus Grinnell, which holds that the risk has to be defined specifically. So in that case, even though people knew generally about the general health risks of cigarette smoking, they did not know the specific risks that cigarette smoking was, was addictive. And therefore the court held that the manufacturer had a duty to warn of that specific risk. And it's the same thing here, even though HVAC technicians like Mr. Johnson know generally about the dangers or the risks of terminal venting, they don't know whether any particular uh, compressor is susceptible to terminal venting. They don't know the telltale signs or noises of a terminal vent, and they don't know how to avoid a terminal vent. And this is important. That's exactly what question number three inquires about. Uh, it asks about whether this compressor, which is defined to, to mean the compressor in this case, uh, conveys, quote, the nature and extent of the danger and how to avoid it, which is exactly the specific risk that we need to focus on. Now, in terms of knowledge, Mr. Johnson did not know about those specific risks. And I think the Court of Appeals did a good job of, of talking about that on page 20 and footnote 10. It recounted the evidence that he, he thought terminal venting occurred on older reciprocating style compressors and not the newer uh, scroll type compressors like the brand new compressor that he had bought and installed the day before. And neither he nor his assistant Morris said that he knew or warned that this particular new compressor that he did just bought and, and installed was susceptible to terminal venting. No one said that because he didn't know that. In fact, he thought the opposite. Now, in terms of the smoke, um, how nuanced does that knowledge have to be? It appears he had some general knowledge, or how specific, or how nuanced, um, you know, does the knowledge by by the user of the product um, need to be? I, I think the specificity, Your Honor, is is defined by the Grinnell case and by the charge in this case, which requires that the product that the warning convey. Um, the nature and extent of the danger and how to avoid it, which to me encapsulates that this particular compressor is susceptible to terminal venting, the telltale signs of a terminal vent, 
and how to avoid it. And in that sense, if I think he, one of the- If he didn't know, why did he ask his assistant to step back? Well, that, that testimony, Your Honor, was related in general. Nobody said it was on this day relating to this compressor. The testimony was simply that in the past, he had told uh, Morris about terminal venting generally. But as, as the Court of Appeals pointed out, I think on page 20, footnote 10, that did not relate to this day or this compressor. And, and the jury was certainly entitled to, to uh, so credit that testimony. Now, in terms of the what I would call the smoking guns, I, I commended the court, Plaintiff's Exhibit 11 in 161-28. These are the Tecumseh warnings. And they show that Emerson's competitors recognized the need to warn about the dangers, the signs, and the, the means to avoid terminal venting. I would ask this, if it's so obvious, why is it that Tecumseh, and Amana, by the way, there's another one, Plaintiff's Exhibit 13, warn about, about these things with great specificity. Also, Plaintiff's Again Exhibit 14. on those warnings, Mr. Levenger, that they wouldn't have made a difference because they talked about sizzling and not, um, I forget exactly the words that were used, not um, the, the kind of noise that was going on here. So is there a causation issue with uh, what, what would have happened if those warnings had been given? Would they have made a difference in this case? Uh, yes, they would have made a difference, Justice Busby, because Mr. Johnson testified that had he had he seen the, the Tecumseh type of warning on this compressor about sizzling, popping, the need to get away, uh, he said, I would have approached this very differently. I, I would have approached this like a pit bull, it was the word he used, instead of a kitten. And he said, I, I would have done a number of things, including let it cool off, approached it more carefully and deliberately, and, uh, and it would have made a difference. Yes. So I think I think that that testimony does establish that that the Tecumseh warning uh, would have made a difference and Tecumseh views views it as a very important thing to give. Um, I think another very important document that goes to a lot of the issues in this case is plaintiff's exhibit one, the Copeland patent, Copeland being a, a predecessor actually of Emerson. The patent describes the defects, It uses the word problem in the prior art terminals and compressors that allow terminal venting. Uh, and it describes how to fix the defects. Uh, it, I think it uses the word solution. So that document, that patent in and of itself, I think goes a long way toward establishing defect, unreasonable danger, and the existence of a safer alternative design, uh, not to mention the, uh, the, 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 the warning problem here. Uh, I wanna drill down a little. Uh, Mr. Levenger, yes. just turning to the jury charge uh, for a minute, uh, in negligence cases, when somebody has specialized training, we often use that um, as the measurement, as the measuring stick. So a doctor using reasonable care and the same in, uh, ordinary care and under the same or similar circumstances. Uh, why shouldn't this have been, this charge have been geared toward uh, the sophisticated user, um, in this case, the technician? Uh, Justice Bland, it actually was. Uh, question number three says that um, unreasonable danger should be viewed from the uh, standpoint, the perspective of the, of the ordinary user of the product with the ordinary knowledge common to the community as to the product's characteristics. Here, um, everyone agreed that the only ordinary user of the product here are trained HVAC technicians. No one, no one argued that that the warning ought to be viewed from the perspective of the man off the street or the owner of the Miller Food Mart or something of that nature. Everyone agree that it should be viewed that, that the ordinary user of the product is a sophisticated, trained HVAC technician. So in that sense, I think the instruction they want was utterly unnecessary. I think it was also wrong. For one thing, in Magro, this court uh, uh, upheld the refusal to give that very kind of instruction about no duty to warn people with special knowledge. I think it's wrong to instruct a jury about when a duty does or does not exist uh, among other problems. So PJC 71.5 was exactly what uh, this warning question tracked. Uh, it was absolutely correct. Um, and, um, and the addition they want not only was incorrect, but I don't think it would have, would have uh, uh, I, in fact, I think probably the addition they want would have actually confused the jury. As it was, there was no confusion. Everyone agreed that the ordinary user of the product was a trained HVAC technician. Um, 
With respect to warnings, one point I want to emphasize is, is about the, the Tecumseh warning concerning the signs uh, and how to avoid terminal venting. Their own expert, Mr. Lance Lucas, was a, was a trained HVAC technician who teaches people about how to use air conditioning. And he agreed that he did not know the telltale signs of terminal venting. And their own corporate representative, Mr. Gephardt, agreed that it would be a good idea to give that warning. Uh, he said, yes, um, I don't know about it either, but, but it sounds like a warning that we should give. And in fact, Tecumseh gave that warning, underscoring the importance of doing so. One point I want to make about the warnings is the, the absence of, of such a warning from Emerson, I think, conveyed the false impression that the Emerson compressor was, was built in a way that eliminated or at least mitigated the effects of terminal venting. With no warning on the compressor, one would get the misleading impression that it, it incorporated all the available safety technologies when in fact it didn't. So I think that made the, the absence of a warning that much more unreasonable da unreasonably dangerous uh, and Mr. showed um, yes. Would it be uh, more unreasonably dangerous only if um, a technician had worked on an Amana, and I forget the other manufacturer you mentioned what, that did contain the warnings. Was there any um, testimony in the record about that? Uh, yes, M Mr. Johnson said that he had seen those warnings in the past on Tecumseh, and I think he said Amana as well, that talked specifically about terminal venting and how to avoid it. But the problem was this, this Emerson compressor had no such warnings at all. And it created the false impression, I think, that that the Emerson compressor did incorporate the modern safety technologies that would uh, that would eliminate or at least mitigate uh, terminal venting. It seems it would create that false impression if you had some uh, preconceived um, notion about a different product with the warnings, and that's why right. I was asking. And he did, and he did. He had seen the Emerson warnings in the past. He had seen the Tecumseh warnings in the past. I. I don't recall if he said he had seen the Amana, but that the Amana came into evidence as plaintiff's exhibit 13. Um, I wanna talk about the gatekeeping, so-called gatekeeping issue for a moment. First of all, they have a real preservation problem. Uh, council mentioned the, mo the uh, pretrial motion to exclude. That says nothing about the argument, the risk utility argument they're currently making. You can see it at uh, volume two of the clerk's record, page 380 to 41, and it, there is nothing in there whatsoever about this risk utility issue. In the Court of Appeals, they didn't preserve the issue either. They, they finally got around to challenging his trial testimony, Mr. Russell's trial testimony, but only as to safer alternative design. They did not challenge it as to unreasonable danger or risk utility. But I would submit to you that the argument is also just flat wrong. Uh, his opinion about design defects uh, is not just based on the failure of the product. We need to look at his, the entire 28 pages of his affidavit the entire 150 pages of, of his direct examination leading up to his ultimate conclusion that it was unreasonably dangerous under the five factors. He, and, and importantly, I think he talked a lot about the patents, the Copeland patent and the Tecumseh patent. He, he began by explaining how the damage to the motor windings uh, drew abnormally high current into the terminal pins. Uh, he talked about how the pins overheated to the point where they, they melted the insulating glass and allowed the pins to, to expel along with the terminal venting materials. Importantly, he said the defect is the absence of these available uh, technologies that would cut off the current before it reaches the pin uh, or uh, would mitigate the effects of a terminal event, terminal event if in fact it did occur. And he backed all this up very carefully by talking about the Copeland patent and the Tecumseh patent. Mr. Which, Levenger? Um, yes. Um, since you're on on um, that topic, um, Mr. Gunn um, spent a lot of time talking about uh, Dr. Russell's failure to address likelihood, and I um, wonder if you might address that. Yes. Uh, in terms of the gravity and likelihood of injury, Your Honor, every, every witness acknowledged that that there was a likelihood of injury in the event that a terminal event occurs, and that it would be severely harmful. Um, the, the Tecumseh warning said that, the Amana warning said that, uh, witnesses agreed to that. At the very end, uh, uh, their, one of their witnesses, Mr. Monier, uh, agreed with the proposition that a terminal event is, is dangerous, 
uh, harmful, injurious, and, and it's all because of this, the pressurized uh, refrigerant and oil that comes expelling out uh, in a scalding fashion. But do you disagree your expert, um, well, excuse me, you, that your expert did not address likelihood? Do you disagree with that? No, absolutely he did. Uh, he, he said that in the event of a terminal event, the likelihood of injury is severe and the gravity of injury is severe. Well, what, about the likely, what about the likelihood of an event? Uh, well, um, I, th I think the, util the, the risk utility factor actually talks about the risk and likelihood of injury, but as to the, as to the risk of a terminal event, I think the, uh, again, I think the Tecumseh warning illustrate and the, and the Copeland patent illustrate the extreme likelihood of that occurring, uh, that when you don't have the protective measures that cut off the current, uh, before it reaches the pins and allows the pins to overheat, you do have a likelihood of a terminal event. And when, when a technician is standing in front of it working, uh, that expelling uh, high pressurized and scalding material uh, is going to hit that person in the face of the upper body, causing severe injuries, just like in this case, 60 degree, 60, uh, second, third degree burns over 60% of his body. So yes, I think the likelihood uh, and gravity of both the risk and the injury were established not only by Dr. Russell, but a, a number of other different witnesses. Um, with respect Mr. to the if I If I can just take you to the um, jury charge issue real quick before you yep. run out of time. So we've said that the five factors, or we've utilized the five factors to evaluate the sufficiency of the evidence on a, creating a fact issue in the summary judgment context. We've never applied them when actually reviewing sufficiency of a jury verdict, of the evidence to support a jury verdict. But we've said specifically that the factors should not be included in the charge to the jury. And um, it seems to me that creates some inconsistency there where the jury is asked to decide the issue of unreasonable dangerous on one ground or one basis, the charge, um, and then when it comes to reviewing a court, a court of appeals, reviewing the charge, if we use the five factors, then it's a different basis. Do you agree that it should all be the same basis in all three instances, the jury's decision, summary judgment review and, um, appeal from jury decision, or is it your contention that there's a good reason to use the different standards in the different circumstances? Uh, Justice Boyd, I don't, I don't have a problem with um, uh, summary judgment review and sufficiency review being based on the five factors. I mean, the Fifth Circuit did exactly that in the Goodner case. Judge Higginbotham wrote the opinion, even though uh, he agreed that the jury did not need to be charged on these factors. I think, I think their solution, I, I, I think what they're suggesting is a solution in search of a problem. And it's really a bad solution to a non-existent problem. Uh, frankly, I think the footnote to uh, this uh, dissenting uh, footnote in the Genie opinion, which you wrote, Justice Boyd, suggested that the that the better rule would be to conform uh, appellate review to the current jury charge rather than the other way around. And I think that makes some sense because because actually the five factors, I think, as the dissent as the footnote pointed out, are maybe restricted in some ways. Uh, without the five factors. Uh, the appellate courts and the jury can consider a whole variety of evidence bearing on the risk utility uh, balance. The five factors are actually in some ways restricting. I, I would also suggest that they're uh, confusing and misleading, particularly in a case of this nature. Uh, the fourth factor, which focuses on obviousness, um, is problematic because in a design defect uh, case, uh, obviousness is not determinative of the duty to design a safe product. And I think the jury may be misled into thinking that it's an element uh, as opposed to merely a factor. Uh, the fifth factor focuses on consumer expectations. That makes no sense in a case like this where nobody's talking about ordinary consumers or their expectations. Uh, we're dealing here with, with trained uh, HVAC technicians. So I think the fifth factor would be very, very problematic. Uh, in actuality, they got everything they wanted in this case because the second and third factor uh, 
very much overlap, I think it's just Judge Higginbotham pointed out in the Goodner case, with the safer alternative design uh, definition. And that was given to the char given to the jury in the design defect question. Uh, moreover, question, uh, excuse me, element uh, four, uh, uh, I think is encompassed in this case in both the warning um, question that was given and the contributory negligence question that was given. And finally, I would point out that, uh, I think as Justice Bus Busby pointed out, uh, the current PJC uh, 71.4 does not in any way inhibit either the proof, uh, the argument before the jury, or the appellate review. Uh, the appellate courts are perfectly free to uh, analyze the sufficiency of the evidence uh, under the five factors, as the court did in Goodner, or based on any kind of uh, uh, evidence relevant to the risk utility balancing. So the long-winded, I think, answer to your question, Justice Boyd, is I think PJC uh, 71.4 works perfectly. Uh, nobody has complained about it in the 25 plus years since the safer alternative design element was added to it. And, um, and it would not be harmful. And the, the refusal to give it was not harmful in this case in any event, because uh, if they'd wanted, the appellate court could have reviewed it, reviewed the evidence under each and every one of these five factors, uh, but they didn't make that argument. With that, I'll close unless the court has any further questions. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Levenger. Mr. Gunn, I believe you have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. To please the court, a, a couple of points. The false impression argument, which you just heard, was the slippery slope that I was cautioning about in the opening, that if we, the more details we give, the more somebody can say, well, you gave me details A, B, C, and D, I had no idea it could happen under F conditions or X. That, that's where I think we end up in an overwarning situation. The, the, I told you the testimony about faint rumbling. He said he heard a rumbling sound. And I think that's what we'll get if we warn the way that the one competitor, Tecumseh, does. The older products point, we just have a different reading of the record. And I'll, I'll give you my view about it. Mr. Johnson didn't say, terminal venting has been eliminated. I thought I was home free because it's one of these new compressors. If he had thought that, he would not have needed to warn Antonio Morris at the Miller Food Mart. He didn't think that. It is true, historically, he had seen a number of compressors that had gone through terminal venting. Uh, Mr. Gunn, did the warning uh, given to Mr. Morris, the helper that Mr. Johnson gave, did that happen at the food mart on the day of the accident? Is that clear in the record? It happened at the food mart. It's not clear what day. It's, it's not clear when. We know that that food mart had, I think it was five replacement comp compressors in six years. So if this was one of the, the company's customers and they were out there a lot. Uh, so we do know that. We know what these compressors were. We know the, the model and the make. Uh, and so, when he, when he warns Antonio about terminal venting, I think that's meaningful. I, you know, I would Mr. like, and, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Gunn, on, the, on that uh, warning question, I, I think a uh, respondent argues that when we're considering whether there's a duty to warn in a particular case, we look at the objective knowledge of the ordinary user. But when we're considering whether the failure to warn or adequately adequately warned caused the harm, we look at the subjective knowledge of the actual user. Do you agree with that protocol for approaching it? I, I do. I, I think that's the way I would do it. Uh, I would also say there are cases which take the subjective part, Justice Boyd, and handle that as a duty issue. And I would refer you to language in Caterpillar and the Fifth Circuit decision in HORAC. For me, it's a causation issue for sure. And we can have a doctrinal discussion about whether it should be duty as well. But I, I don't have any quarrel with that construct. Either way, we, we're saying with this 100 word warning and the four pictorials and his specialized knowledge, that you're not gonna have John Q. Pedestrian off the street servicing this compressor. With all of that together, he knew plenty subjectively 
he had already warned Antonio about terminal venting because those pins can come out so fast that that's like a bullet. So he warned him. This plaintiff knew exactly what he was doing. He made up his own mind how he was going to approach this unit on this day. And there is no causal connection. So I would ask the court, base it on causation. If, if we did uh, look at this through uh, the element of causation, does it matter that it was a brand new um, compressor installed just the day before? I, I don't think I follow, I'm not. I'm, well, I, in terms of I, awareness of a risk. I, I think the risk is the risk that all compressors are susceptible to venting because that's the nature of pressure. Just like all champagne bottles can pop a cork. We will never eliminate that. There is no suggestion it can be eliminated. It has not been eliminated. So he knows, and, and you're right, it may go into his thinking, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna handle this? But, but he knows about the risk and he knows don't, you know, don't use a torch, wear the goggles, et cetera, et cetera. He trampled those warnings and I lament the injuries, but he made up his mind that he was gonna test it his way. And this happened once. We don't have any other, uh, this was our first experience like this. And the, the likelihood was really very small. So I see the time is expiring and unless the court has further questions, this will conclude the argument for me. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Gunn. The case is submitted and uh, we'll take a, a brief recess. Thank you.